I'm so excited for this. This is basically the French, like, spit by. It's a beautiful... Ugh. Okay, I need to get into this, guys. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Mono Making Time, and today we're looking at a bit of an unusual set. It's a double set. It's Hella's Battle of France set. I wanted the set for an absolute age, and I got it on, you know, everyone's favourite online auction site for too high of a price, and decided, hey, I'm just going to do two different videos for it. The D520 is also one that I've previously built in my Testing Every Manufacturer of Paint series, and because um, it used Hella's paints and the ones I had were unfortunately past their best. It didn't look too great, but I'm really excited to build it now and use life color set on it and just get an absolute gorgeous rendition of this fantastic aircraft. As is standard, we're going to be having a look at the history of this aircraft, this aircraft in gaming, and the history of the model kit itself. Make sure to use the timestamps if you want to skip to a particular section, and we'll also look at the construction and the final result of that afterwards. Also, make sure you take breaks in this video, have a cup of tea, pause it, but if there's one thing you always remember to do, it's to hit that subscribe button. <laughs> right, I guess we should get into the history of the video. I'm sure this is going to be long enough as it is. Let's go. So, the D520 was a 1936 response to a requirement for a modern fighter that revolved around being armed with a 20mm cannon. This is two years after the MS-406 from Moran Sonlier had already taken a massive leap forward for French aviation. What's up? What's up? Archie's excited for the history of this too, apparently. The original development for this aircraft was based on the SED-510, an earlier successful design by Lewitwine. The Z-510 came out of the 1920s and 1930s and had fixed undercarriage. It was a much more dated design compared to what the French Air Force were looking for, but it would make the perfect basis for a modern fighter. As we'll learn during the course of this, this was a passion of Emile Delcline, the lead designer, at the firm. I'm not sure if I'm even saying the company's name or his name correctly, so I do apologise if I've got it massively wrong, as we found in my uh, Henschel video. <laughs> so this initial version was the D513 and was not very successful. In fact, ultimately it's why the MS405 was chosen. Now you noticed earlier that I said the D520 came after the MS406 and that's correct, but its basis was from the competition that originally devised the MS405 and the MS406. So Emile Delphine was completely unbounded and knew that they could meet the requirements the French Air Force was going to set out. They were looking at the contemporaries of their allies, so they were looking at the Spitfire and Hawk Hurricane in the RAF and wanted a fighter that would be comparable. Ultimately, they knew what they had in the MS-406 and the MS-405 would only go so far. So in 1936, the French Air Ministry put out the request for a modern fighter that would be more sophisticated to the MS-405 and MS-406 and Double Time took its chance. After having realised they should have been comparing aircraft to the British aircraft sooner, the French ultimately said Double Time's initial aircraft was not up to comparison of the Hulk Hurricane and Spitfire and needed further development. Work continued in September of 1936 all the way up into January the following year to develop a new superstar of the European aviation circuit. France was, however, unimpressed and looked at developments of the MS-405 or MS-406, which is the MS-405, and also at other developments of existing aircraft, such as the CR-714, which would be the CR-770, and there were was also two other aircraft that did see production, one of which was the Block MB-152, which, uh, I mean, obviously we'll be doing at some point. And the other one was the Arsenal BG-33, which, if I can get the cat, I'll also be doing at some point. <laughs> Double Time was not having much luck, and its aircraft was not ordered to prototype stage. In fact, Double Time was absorbed by the Société Nationale de Construction Aeronautique de Midi, S-N-C-A-M. <laughs> Yeah, France's companies were horrendously made. Very literal, actually. <laughs> and you'll probably recognise that this is something similar to what happened with the Loire Moubois when we looked at that aircraft. This meant that there were even further delays to the Z520. However, now a part of this firm, Emile Delphine had the position to push forward his design, and in October of 1938, it flew for the first time. The first prototype 
can live up to expectations, something this ever seemed to uh, have a running theme of. However, at least now it was flying, they could identify the problems and eradicate them. Part of that was the underwing radiators, which caused a lot of drag and weren't actually that efficient. So these were replaced by a more traditional fuselage-based radiator. The aircraft was continually developed until finally in February of 1939, it reached the speed that it needed to of 530 kilometers an hour or approximately 330 miles per hour and a diving speed of 825 kilometers an hour or 530 miles per hour. As is normal, development continued, but the type was showing promise. And it was at this stage that Belgium decided, you know, it was going to order some of the type. We've made this joke before that Belgium always ordered licensed productions and never really got the chance to use them. And this was another example of that. As far as I could see from my research, they never actually got to the point of officially saying they were going to build them. It was showing interest and I assume if the war hadn't happened maybe another year or two, they would produce some, but you know, other air forces did, and Poland ordered 160 of the type. Well, was approaching, and when it struck, Poland's order of 160 never came to fruition. France immediately ordered 1,280 aircraft at a rate of 200 aircraft a month, and the Aeronautique Navelle, the French naval air force essentially, had also ordered an additional 120. By April of 1940, the initial order had increased all the way to 2,250 aircraft. This was viewed as quite an important aircraft for France. One of the unique aspects of this aircraft as compared to some of its French contemporaries, not so much international as we'll see, it was very fast to produce, taking around 7,000 hours to produce. This was a third of the time of Italian command breeze, the NC-200 and the NC-202, and it was also half of that of the D-510 that it originally came from. Not only that, it was half the time of the MS-406 to produce, and this was a markedly better aircraft. Yet, in comparison, the BF-109 would end up taking four and a half thousand hours to produce, so this still did have quite a long way to go, but still, it was a marvel of French aviation, and really, even compared to other air arms, it was really fast to produce. And low. The type was swarming the Army de l'Air, but realistically, there were just simply not enough of the type produced in order to sway the tide of war. I assume Archie just didn't like the war. During the Battle of France, though, the type proved to be a fierce adversary. A famous account from the 14th of May 1940 saw 36 aircraft engage a German air raid. With two of their own aircraft being lost, they managed to take down four BF 110s, two BF 109s, two Dombia DO 17s, and two Heinkel HE 111s. The amount of firepower they were facing, that's absolutely incredible. Indeed, the highest scoring ace of the Armée de l'Air was Pierre Le Blanc. He managed to take down four German and seven Italian aircraft, and after the uh, capitulation of France and the establishment of Vichy France, they managed to take out seven British aircraft as well. It really does just show the viability of the type. As our version is for the Battle of France, that's where our story ends. We will take the story and further, but in the future, maybe we'll look at additional types, such as those used by Vichy France. Internationally, this had massive potential for the air forces of Belgium, Poland, and Romania before those countries' fates were sealed. After the capitulation of France, it was still used and reduced by Vichy France, and was also used by additional forces of the Frontier Aeronautica of Italy, the Luftwaffe of Germany, and the Vonal Vaz Bushni Silly, if I said that even remotely close, of Bulgaria. Had France put more focus on this type in place of more unusual examples like the CR714 and swapped over to this in place of the less adequate types like the MS405 and MS406, then perhaps we could have seen a France that was able to stand the tide of German invasion. That was not our reality, however, and unfortunately this type just wasn't sufficient in number to make a real difference. However, this aircraft remains an icon of France in World War II and a popular subject to this day. Sadly, the only flying version of this aircraft did crash in 1986 on the 13th of July. However, you can still visit them in a museum. And hey, what's better is on aircraft tube on YouTube, we can still watch the footage of this aircraft flying and it's absolutely beautiful. I guess that's it for it in real life. What? Have a look at the aircraft in gaming, shall we? For once in this French series, we're going to be able to start with Flight Simulator and Combat Flight Simulator. Yes, 
Today we're looking at Flight Simulator X and Combat Flight Simulator 3. For Flight Simulator X, I found footage from Roland Laboy, and this is from like six years ago, and it says it's a development of the Phantom NT, but it was the main one I could see. Links to the actual aircraft itself, I couldn't find too much information on, and I wasn't necessarily it myself when I could already see the footage online. However, to Combat Flight Simulator 3, I couldn't even find footage of it, less alone finding a free download because Although the game itself is abandoned where apparently this pseudo expansion pack is not. This expansion pack was released by A2A Simulations in the Firepower expansion, but again, I couldn't really see much information about it. The trailer for the actual um, product itself just looked like the models were pretty good. Again, really dated game and this expansion is also dated, but it doesn't look too bad. So I'm assuming it probably looked okay. If you're really dying with the D520 and CFS3, I'm sure this is where you can get it. But to be honest, I'd say there are better places on this list to look for it. Another revelation for this video, instead of looking at ILC 1946, which obviously you can play this in, we're looking at Cliffs of Dover, a much newer IL2 game. And this aircraft looks stunning. I've seen so many editions of this online. I've seen people doing the Battle of France and flying this against all see the Luftwaffe. I've seen people doing it in the Battle of Britain. If like some D520s had escaped to Britain and were fighting the Regia Aeronautica and Luftwaffe forces over Britain. It's really, really cool. And there's also the campaign in Africa to think of as well. Obviously, this title is the most expensive and we're looking at today. You know, actually having to pay for it for one and not being abandoned where and not being a real game on Steam. <laughs> But it does look absolutely superb, and to be honest, this kind of is really something. <laughs> but we all know where this is going, guys. War Thunder. War Thunder has a lot of nations' tech trees in the game already, and when France was added, I was ever so excited to fly some of my favourite types, and the D520 was certainly one of them. I'm really happy that it's in this game for me to be able to fly it as well. Unlike some of my others, I haven't done the cinematic on this, to be honest, that's because I fell so far behind that I just decided I was just gonna, you know, have the space for the best one anyway, which is the CR714. But as an aircraft at 3.0, this aircraft won't take you very long to get to, and you'll have an absolute joy flying it. It's definitely competitive for its tier, and it's one of my go-tos when I just, you know, need to chill out. Okay, um, I guess we need to head over to Model A then, and I... Wow, this is also quite abundant. So this aircraft was originally released in 1965 under Heller's Musée series. Its boxings would remain consistent up until 1974. As usual, Busco got a release of the type as well, but there was also a really interesting one released by Progressive Work Nuremberg? It looks like just as sort of essentially a German boxing of the Heller kit. I'd never seen this before Heller branded stuff, so interesting. In 1979, the boxing was changed to hella sort of black box version as you talked about before. This was before, you know, my least favourite style of box art in 1981, with the model sort of built and then mirrored on a slightly yellow surface. However, a new hella version was released in 1988 with a, a better box art, though I will say I think I prefer the absolute original. Prior to this though, a release was made by Smur, which had sort of a unique artwork and you're probably still likely to see the Smurr version around today. However, following that release in 1988, Halo for some reason just haven't released it, and I don't really understand why. I assume the molds are either lost or sold on or just need a significant amount of work, because other releases have been made. Again, we've had Smurr releasing the kit up until 2006, and other manufacturers as well, such as the Infus Vistacraft, has released it as late as 2016, something you can see practically available online. So one has to wonder, is this going to be re-released by Hella? Because they've released the MS-406, the Block MV-152, but they haven't released the CL-714 or the D520. Interesting, isn't it? So Hella, if you're ever thinking about releasing a new mold of a World War II aircraft, the D520 would be fantastic because you don't have much competition except your own old mold. <laughs> and hey, even re-releasing this one would be Spaculous, honey. There are way too many other releases for me to go through them all, including releasings and toolings from RS Models, Hasagawa, Frog, and releases by Hobby Boss. So I'm probably likely to revisit in the future. As we said, there's the Vichy series of aircraft to look at as well, 
and on top of that, there's some unique paint jobs to the setup too. That's it honey, she's made it halfway through this video. If you haven't already, make sure to like this video and hit the subscribe button. We're going to be heading into the unboxing now, and then after that, the construction. Let's get into it. Okay, so we have the Bâtiment de France from Hella from 1990, the 50th anniversary set for the Battle of France. And the box art isn't absolutely fantastic. It could have been so spectacular, but I'm glad this set exists. And it's a triple set with a Stuka, a Block 174 and a D520. You've got the information about the aircraft involved on the side. And a little square of the box art and then the dimensions of the aircraft as well which is always nice to have on because that's not always included. This is from the Humbrol era of Hella and hence the logo is that simple um, blocky version that I think emerged in the 80s if I remember correctly, 70s, 80s. We've got the decals which is one sheet for this and then we've also got all three kits. Look at them, the stickers in the middle there. Block 174 is on the left and the D520 and to give you a hint I've built two of these I haven't built the Stuka yet that is on the to-do list but let's have a look at this one the D520 first of all and it's uh wow you can see it's the emptiest pack <laughs> it's a very very simple kit two fuselage halves the underwing the top parts of the wings and the undercarriage and the canopy you can see though, reflecting in the light is quite a lot of detail considering the age of this kit. I'm always very surprised by this. I thought this kit would have almost no detail. Yep, here we are with quite a significant amount. Again, considering the age of it. Although probably paying about the same as you would for a modern kit to get this, but I don't hold it against it. The D520 is so beautiful. <laughs> you can see the plastic is probably not the best. Hella seem to have a really weird time with plastic. Even today, you get several different types of plastic in there, um, sort of releases. So this one is no different. It's very easy to clean up though. The clear parts seem okay. I don't know if it's due to age, but they're not the super crystal clear that I would have hoped for, but they'll do. Probably about a five or six out of 10. Again, they're just very mediocre. This almost newspaper-like thing is the instructions. I love it. I love how bold it's the Battelle de France. It's just, oh, it's spectacular. And I love that everyone can read the history. I mean, if you have good eyesight, because it's in pretty small font. <laughs> the instructions, however, are very big and very clear, which is a nice change for Hella. At least for their older kits. The new ones aren't so bad, but older kits, my gosh, Hella, they're not the best. But yeah, the D520s are very simple, all black and white, and there's not really a lot you can do wrong. This is a very, very simple kit. So this boxing, as I say, is a bit different. It is a dual box series. It's the Battle of France, and also features Stuka, which at some point I'll probably have to do. But at its core, it's a basic color kit, and it looks pretty good. I'm really excited to get into the actual construction of this because I think I did a great job with the painting yet again. I really enjoy doing like this French February series because it pushed me to really develop my skills as a modeler and an airbrusher and do a lot of kits that I've always wanted to do and just never had the time to do. Although we're midway through March now and I'm just finishing it because you know, life happens, but you know, what can you do? A girl's gotta do what a girl's gotta do. Oh, and although I'm not wearing them today, trust me, berets are fair to say. I bought a yellow number beret, so, you know, I'm just having a bit of a chill day. Right, let's get into the construction. <laughs> As we head into the construction then, I need to apologize a little bit. So, I messed up a little bit. <laughs> For whatever reason, I had it accidentally really zoomed in, and it's got the worst video footage I've ever had of making a model kit, but alas, I could not not do it. I, I love this kit so much, so we're still cracking on with it. I'm just trimming the parts to make sure they all fit together really nicely and that everything's going to be flush once it's all put together and assembled. The propeller shaft is just a very basic structure and it's got a hole in so you're just putting a stopper on the end to make sure it doesn't fall out. I am gluing it together because there's not really a lot you need to do. And for the inside, again, it's just going to end up sort of a green. In fact, I can't even remember if I ended up painting the inside because you're barely going to see it anyway. 
the propeller is in I'm just turning it to make sure it does still turn and uh, you know it's always nice to make sure it does so that if you want to get a picture of it in slightly different angles then you can do so because sometimes it just looks too perfect I think I don't know if anyone else feels that way now you've noticed that I've probably left the uh, glass accidentally but I haven't the cockpit glass that's got to go inside the fuselage I'm doing afterwards because I figured I'll paint it all and then I'll just be able to sort of put them in that, that proved quite difficult in the end <laughs> so in hindsight I would have glued them in um, using sort of my glue and glaze and then I probably would have just masked them off but you know you live and you learn don't you I'm sticking the top up parts of the wings in a moment but I'm just going to dry fit and make sure that the wing goes in really nicely I've already noticed one section where it's not so I'm going to have to trim that but it looks like it mostly goes on once it's on I'm making sure the wings fit fully when assembled so I'm gluing it on but the underside isn't actually glued in place so I'm just trying to make sure everything aligns and there's not going to be any really nasty surprises for when I actually have to you know fully glue everything together I think this is something I try and always do when it's sort of an underside and to your upper surfaces because you really never know if it's all going to fit otherwise now there are some gaps and with gonna be honest we're just gonna deal with them and the underside I'm not too fussed about there are a couple of bits that we have to add on post construction essentially and post painting as well I actually added a few bits on because I knew they would probably get damaged otherwise you can see a hole for one of them at the top there but otherwise this is pretty much it it's done it's a very simple kit as I said this is one of the easiest kits in the world I wish Hello would release this as well musée or whatever you know their equivalent is to the Vintage Classics because this would make a fantastic kit for like you know five pounds or if they could ever do that if they could go below FX of 6.99 that would be astounding because this is a beautiful rendition and it's perfect for a new starter everything's in place on this kit now and it's ready for painting and we're going to be airbrushing it for the airbrushing i'm using life colors army de l'air set and uh, i'm starting with the uh, darker gray color i have undercoated all of this with tamiya's primer as i always do it's pretty much a religious ceremony at this point so i'm just using a really light bit of pressure letting a little bit of paint out i'm just trying to feather it on there now although the video for the 714 came out first i uh, hadn't actually done that yet so this was me trying to learn how to use the airbrush without letting too much pressure off make sure i can get lines and freehand stuff because that's how i paint as a brush painter and how i want to paint as a airbrusher as well so i was really happy that i managed to do this quite well I did get some little bits where I oversprayed or I didn't sort of do an empty glass at the end to get out any excess paint from the needle but you know they're all sort of learning experiences. I was painting this and the Block 174 at the same time, the same way that when I did my Moran Sonnier MS406 and the Wan Nupar 411, I was doing both of them at the same time. It's just efficient painting, plus I'm not going to waste any paint that's, you know, I've put into the, uh, the airbrush because well, I've got two to do and generally I do a couple of coats on each one. You can see the grey looks kind of translucent at this point and that's just because I'm doing really, really thin layers. I'm going to do two layers on pretty much every colour but I'm not going to show you me doing two layers because I mean that would be kind of boring wouldn't it <laughs> at the moment though this does sort of remind me of that uh, Yak 3 I did the Zvesta one doesn't it a sort of two-tone grey scheme but this is much lighter than that is it's almost it's like a winter scheme <gasps> maybe I should do a D520 winter scheme that would look really cool so ignore all the paint on my hand where I've been testing <laughs> Yeah, pressure she definitely shouldn't be doing, but it's how I do it. I'm now doing the green, still life color. Everything you're going to see on this aircraft, sort of for the camouflage anyway, is life color. You can see that I'm just still doing the same technique, just trying to freehand it because masking camouflage to me is not super fun. And for some cases, it's really justified. I think Italian aircraft, um, or Bulgarian, German, a lot of access stuff to be perfectly honest can sometimes need it 
but I'm not too bothered about it on stuff like this where it's just sort of a blocky camouflage. I'm not someone who's like a stickler for super historic accuracy. I'm not trying to rebuild anyone's plane in particular. If I was, I'd probably do a bit more masking, but as it happens, I'm just trying to make a really nice example of the D520. So I'm using some reference images whilst I go, using the box image as well, but really, I'm, I'm just really trying to make a nice example just for me to look at. And I think that's something that's important to remember is that if you make a mistake, I mean, it's a famous thing to Bob Ross said, it can just be a happy little accident. Sometimes it pays not to be a rivet counter, I guess, because I can get away with that. But I know, you know, for some of you, you want the absolute accuracy. And uh, well, I guess you have to do more masking than I do. <laughs> I'm just going over the green still, just trying to make it a little blend. I'm, I'm going for quite a soft blend if I can. I don't like the sort of super harsh colors. I feel like it's not really as true as it should be. I don't know, it just doesn't look right to me on French aircraft. I like a little soft blend. I don't know why I've got that image stuck in my head because it's not how a lot of them were, but I did a lot of research, um, particularly with VFC. We were sat on a Discord called Modeling Together and I just, we, we were like sending each other images of French aircraft back and forth going, oh, this one's sort of feathered, this one's very feathered, this one's not feathered at all. These ones are all like pretty harsh lines. Some of them look almost cartoonish in terms of how they're blended. And in the end, I just went, you know what? No, that's it. I'm just going for the feather. I'm not going to correct anything. I'm just leaving it as it is. <laughs> so on things like my 406, it's a lot more rigid. On stuff like this, it's a lot softer. I mean, I think it looks a bit sexier. So yeah, this brown is a uh, sort of almost reddish brown. I can really appreciate that when I've gone in sort of softer like I have with this one. I'm probably being a bit more reserved than a lot of people would do the airbrush. You know, I'm going quite soft with it. It looks like I'm doing a lot of motions. I'm really not. It's probably just <laughs> my nails really exaggerating it. It's just uh, a lot of really small movements to let a little bit of paint out. You can see that it's not that wet because it is drying quite quickly, which is how it should be with an airbrush really anyway. Obviously it does need to cure a little bit anyway before you do too much rough handling. I will say straight away that I did, for whatever reason, <laughs> forget to do the decals, and I apologise for this. I don't know why I just forgot to record it, but apparently I did. So we're going to be pretty much left with a fully painted model, and then when we see the uh, D520 pop in off, then uh, you can see it with all the decals on. But just to let you know, the decals were... I mean, they survived, but I basically had to soak them extra long. And I was using a colder water because I find that's less harsh than a hot water is and it tends to not have them break apart as much. The consequence was the blue backing paper sort of just dissolved. I don't know. It just, my desk went blue. Like genuinely, my desk was dyed blue. I did manage to get it all off eventually, but it took a lot of quite strong cleaning products. So I'm not sure you saw what was in them and if it was actually healthy for you. Just a word of warning, maybe. <laughs> this is one of the sections where, as you can see, I opened the paint very slightly, and it means that it's coming out not quite how I want. It's not quite as controlled as I would like it to be. But, you know, I'm just vibing with it. I'm just trying to go with it, because I don't want to have to, you know, redo all my paint. And you'll notice I'm not really that bothered about the inside, and that's because I do my underside last, and I do it all freehand, <laughs> and I just, make it have like straight lines just from me doing it you'll see what i mean in a minute that was a really poor explanation the brown i'm doing in layers as well just to make sure that you know i don't get rid of too much of the detail but i can get a really nice color from it again this is partly because i slightly overthin the paint for whatever reason the brown is the one that i had the most difficulty with which is kind of funny because i think i had the green with the difficulty last time you can see me going with the light grey underneath now, and it's not a massive difference in colour from the Tamiya primer, but it is noticeable. And I'm doing it all freehand here, and you can see, and I'm wiping a little bit off because I got a little bit of splash over. And the back of the tail, it does sort of go up into the underside, and then we're putting decals on the very back of it anyway, so I'm not too bothered about that side. But yeah, I do one side of it, and I'll let it dry, and I'll do the other side of it, and 
that's pretty much it. That's how I do it. I don't, you know, I, I don't really worry too much. The same at the front. I just, again, held it at sort of an equal angle and just did the underside as well. And you get a really nice clean line. If there's any mistakes, I don't think I'd had to on this one, but I have gone back and cleaned them up with a brush before. But yeah, pretty easy. All the bits that I ran painted otherwise, I just did with the brush. So it's the propeller and the cone and the undercarriage. That was all just done with the brush paint and probably Ravel Aquacolor paints, if memory serves, which is um, sort of tar black. Uh, probably steel for the undercarriage, if I remember. But yeah, that's it. Okay, so like I say, this was a really easy kit, realistically. It's no different to the MS406. Obviously, that boxing is a newer release of the Musee series, and unlike most Hello reboxing or re-releases, this doesn't have any colour instructions, it doesn't have any colour decal sheets, it doesn't have a revised decal sheet, it is just the bare basic kit. But this basic bitch kit can blow up. So let's have a look at it popping off. What do you think? I mean, I sort of nailed it, I think. The main criticism I know I'm gonna get is the sort of feathering I have on the camouflage. It's sort of more of a blended camouflage rather than solid edges. Looking at lots of different examples of French aviation during the course of World War II, I've seen examples that are a bit softer edges. I've seen them that are very harsh, blocky edges. And I've seen some that are sort of in the middle. For me, I went for the softer approach. It felt a lot more natural, and I think it just looks nicer overall. And hey, it's gotta be sitting on my shelf, not yours, honey. So if you want one that's got harder edges, go make it yourself. But let's get into whether you should buy this kit or fly away from it. Because of it being one of the easiest accessible versions of the D520 in 170 second scale, absolutely please buy this kit. However, it just comes with the word warning. If you're buying the Mr. Craft version, my understanding is it's essentially a mirror, so it's like a reverse engineer's version, and you will probably have some difficulty. It's going to be a less high quality mold than the original Hella mold would be, again, just from what I've seen online. So my recommendation comes from the Hella kit, and I'm assuming the Smurr kit, because I think the Smurr one was a proper licensed production version, I think. Either way, when you stick to the Hella one, you can tend to get them online for between 8 to 15 pounds I think and I wouldn't say that's too bad it's a much older kit so just remember that and compared to you know Airfix's vintage classic series you are paying a lot more for this kit but it's not too bad and I mean the Battle of France set I probably paid just over a tenner a model and I've seen it go anywhere between sort of 20 pounds to 40 pounds online so this is a really good value proposition and hey if you're building a lot of French aircraft if you get a set like the life color set that I've been using and I'm not sponsored by why I just have become obsessed with their paints then it's just another example that you can paint using the same scheme and for someone who's very you know money conscious right now like me 
then that's definitely a really interesting way to do this. Obviously, you might want to add some additions to this. There are aftermarket things available, but I've not done that. I've just built it as it was out of the box, even using the decals. I was quite surprised that the costume managed to survive, though part of my desk was stained blue for quite a while due to sort of the uh, paper that it used. So I kept washing my hands because I felt really paranoid about what was in it that it was paper sort of actually leaking blue. But hey, at the end of the day, we got a really nice aircraft out of this. And this, again, is one of my favourite all-time aircraft. I definitely want to make one of these as a jet aeronautica. And probably not even do it in like the flat green camo. I really want to do one in like proper Italian, sexy gorgeous camouflage. Because let's face it, despite what you might think about Italian aircraft, that camouflage was gorgeous, honey. But yeah, I think that probably wraps it up. Thank you so much for joining me today. I've had a blast. I hope you've enjoyed being here too. Yes, you in particular. And if you've enjoyed what you've seen here, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. I release new videos most Mondays. Also, if you can support the channel and want to do so financially, you can do through becoming a channel member. But again, I really want to reiterate, don't do this if it's not actually affordable for you. I know a lot of people go like, yeah, I really need to support people, but take a break. Other people probably have got you covered anyway with the support that I'm getting. You know, you do you. Make sure you're okay. I'm also going to be trying to do some other stuff as well. Although live streams on Sundays are a bit difficult, you know, work-life balance and also that I go to a lot of model shows, but I'm going to be trying some new things anyway. So, watch this space. I also wanted to say that no matter who you are, where you're from, whatever you're doing in life, you got this. You're probably much more amazing than you realise that you are. And whatever's happening in your life right now, I know that you'll overcome it. Keep on rocking. It's okay not to be okay sometimes. See you later, guys. Bye. As usual, I need to say thank you to my channel members. For the advanced kits, we have Votech and 50s Bin Man. They're new to the channel, so thank you so much. We've also got John Alex Scale Modeling, Crazy Locher, and of course, Explosive Water. I also wanted to give an extra shout out to Crazy Locher today just because they've given so much support to the channel and I really want you to know how much I appreciate it. So thank you so much. And also, all my starter kits, you guys are amazing too. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here today, make sure to hit that subscribe button. There's also a recommended video for you here as well. Why aren't you checking it out? YouTube really wants you to see it. And so do I. Have fun modeling.